is my Savior, I shall not be moved. In His love and favor, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters, Lord, I shall not be moved. In my Christ abiding, I shall not be moved. In His love I'm hiding, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the waters. I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall orders, Lord, I shall not be moved. I shall not be moved. Lord, I shall not be us as we spend some time in scripture this morning. Help us, Lord, to learn to live and walk in the Spirit 
help us Lord to Lord to just be full of that joy which is our strength and Lord Lord with what you have given us to overcome Lord we are overcomers and we thank you Lord even for that word Lord that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world and we ask that you'll help us even as we read scripture this morning to see what you're telling us that the battle is the Lord's and we shall overcome in Jesus name Amen Now we are um, looking through the Old Testament and we are looking for Jesus in the Old Testament (coughs) and thank God it's very easy to find him he is everywhere He's even in our church this morning. It's a lovely sense of the Lord's presence in the prayer meeting. We need to be sensitive to the Lord being with us. Now, we have been looking over the last five weeks at the the five books of Moses, what's known as the Pentateuch. I'll not make a joke about Pentateuchters, but (laughs) praise God for the five books of Moses. The Jewish people deeply respect the first five books of the Bible. They read them in the synagogue. And you know when they finish reading them, they go through them, what they do is they actually take the Torah on their head and they dance around the synagogue. Now, I don't know if we'll do that this morning if we get to the end of the sermon. Maybe some of you will dance if we get to the end of the sermon. But they dance with the Torah and then they start over again. And they read it all over again. And um, we have been seeing Jesus in these five books written by Moses. And when we looked at Genesis, we saw that he's the seed of the woman that bruises the head of the serpent. When we looked at Exodus, we saw that he was the Passover lamb who kept away the the angel of death. When we looked at uh, Leviticus, we saw that he is the great high priest and also he is our scapegoat. And we looked at uh, Numbers. Uh, we saw that he is... Um, I'm going to mix up here. What did we see? I was never good at arithmetic at school. When I get the numbers, I'm always stumped. Hallelujah. We saw that he was the... What did we see in Numbers? See, you don't pay attention. Uh, hallelujah. Numbers, we saw that he was, well, Deuteronomy, we saw that he was a prophet like unto Moses. So you need to go home and look that Numbers one up. Uh, and I'll tell you at the end, right? If you're right, okay? I'll tell you something else you could do. We've been putting uh, the teaching on uh, the website because... Um, the Sunday school teachers don't get to into the service and uh, when I go home on a Sunday afternoon I put the this, this sermon on the, on the website but we've been doing it for so long now we've actually run out of space on our website so I've set up a YouTube channel for the archive so we've started putting the old stuff onto the YouTube channel so I'll, I'll get that dealt with when we um, uh, get to the point of having to do it because we're running out of space. Wouldn't it be wonderful we were running out of space in the church? We ran out of space yesterday. We couldn't get any more kids into the to the activity church. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we run out of space? Hallelujah. Jesus in numbers I'll put you out his your misery. He's the serpent on the he's the brazen serpent on the pole. Jesus said in John chapter 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be, be lifted up. And what a clear picture of what we've just celebrated this morning, the crucified one. Now we're only scratching the surface. Jesus is all over Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Why is he all over them? Because that man that wrote these books was a prophet. People talk about prophets as if they fall off the trees. We're getting all sorts of religions springing up and they've all got their prophets. 
But can I tell you something about Moses? I'm going to read something to you before we move on. Exodus 34, 29 to 35 says these words. <coughs> when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him and he gave them all the commandments the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Moses was an exceptional person in the timetable of God's salvation. King James Version says that he wished not that his face shone. Isn't that wonderful? I always find that very quaint. He wished not that his face shone. Isn't it wonderful when people are so filled with God it just shines right out of them? Now he, it, he spoke with God face to face. That is why what we have in the first five books of Moses is so phenomenally accurate. Because he had an interview with God. An interview with God and he wrote them down. And you know, the, the time he came down the mountain, the people were pretty sick. And you know, when some people are pretty sick in here, they go to the medicine cabinet and get a couple of tablets, don't they? Well, God gave them a couple of tablets and he gave them the Decalogue. He gave them the law of God. And it stood the test of time. It's only now that we're beginning to think we don't need it. And we've moved away from the foundations of what God has given us as a nation. Because our society was based on the Ten Commandments. And it worked. Because it came from an interview with God. And his face was radiant. And when Moses was writing uh, the five books of Moses, God already had the plan of salvation built into that book, into these books. Hallelujah! So we're now leaving behind the, the Pentateuch. We're no longer Pentateuchters. And we're moving into the book of Joshua. And what Caleb said there is quite timely. Because we're talking about moving into the promised land. Sometimes we've been round the mountain long enough. And some Christians are like that. They go around in circles. And sometimes we need to break free. We need to come out of our orbit and make a landing. Hallelujah! Praise God! So we're in the book of Joshua. Let me read to you this first, just to get the context. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to, to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people Get ready to cross the Jordan River to the land that I am going to give to them, to the Israelites. And you move on, it says, As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'm down at verse 6 now, if you're following me. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land. And I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful. To obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may be successful wherever you go. Hallelujah. Now we as a nation have turned to the left and the right. We're going all over the road. I'm departing from the law of God. So don't expect success in our nation anymore. Don't expect it. We've been given an instruction. But in your own life, obey what God is saying to you. 
Now, will we find Jesus in the book of Joshua? Well, the word Joshua actually means Jehovah is Saviour. Or, to put it into the New Testament word, the word for Joshua in the New Testament is Jesus. Jesus. So there he is right in the title. The word Jesus means Saviour. Right in the title. Because they're going to move from their wanderings in Canaan's land and they're going to cross into the promised land. Of course we will find Christ in it and there are multiple examples of the story of Christ. For example, they had to um, face their Jericho. The walls had to come down and they had to go in faith. And they had to march according to the command of the Lord. But you know, before they did that, the spies had gone in. Remember the story? The story of Rahab, the woman who sheltered the spies. Let them down. It's in the wall. And she was told the wall was going to come down. But to protect her, she had to tie a red cord on her house. And that red cord was her salvation. And you know, there's a red cord which is our salvation this morning, the same as that red blood that was on the doorpost and the altar. It's the blood of the Lamb that keeps us safe when judgment comes, as judgment will. For God is a just God. He gives judgment. He doesn't overlook sin, but he, his wrath will face up to sin. But thank God, he meted out his wrath for my sin on his own son on the cross. And the red line, the red line was the difference between life and death for Rahab. Because when the walls fell down, she was saved. And she was saved by the red line, which speaks of the blood of the Savior. And we could go in and go on and whatever. And there are all sorts of types and shadows of salvation in the book of Joshua. Praise God. That's just one example of them. What side of the line are you on this morning? Are you behind the blood? Does the blood cover you? So that when the angel of death comes and judgment comes, you are passed over and delivered. Or are you are outside of the blood? Are you trusting in something else? Trusting in your good works? Trusting in your heritage? Trusting in your own intellect or whatever? Well, I tell you, only the blood can give you salvation. Amen? Hallelujah. Now, also, before we go on to speak about Joshua himself, these people were a called out people. They were called out from slavery of Egypt. They were, as we studied numbers, we discovered they were a rebellious people. Uh, we remember the story, we were talking in numbers, how uh, the, the plagues came amongst them because they, they kept rebelling against God and speaking against their leaders and speaking against the food they were receiving, and they were unhappy, and plagues came. Even though the cloud sat above them, that wonderful sight, and by night time it, it began to glow with the fire of God. They were a frightening people, because God was moving with a people. There was a point in history when the works of God were so manifest, the nations around them were terrified. But they themselves became familiar. That's why they were frightened to go near Moses. They didn't want Moses, they wanted someone to speak instead of this because they were frightened from facing up to the fire of God. And remember when we talked about Deuteronomy last week, God said, what they say is good. I will send to them a prophet like unto me. And of course we know that the prophet like unto Moses, this Israelite from amongst their own people, when he came, he will show them his words, God's word. He will only teach what he has been given to teach. And if the people do not listen, they will be accountable to God. And this was Jesus Christ. Jesus, he himself said, I only speak that which I have been given of the Father. And listen, Christian, you be very careful when you're witnessing. Be very careful, by the way. Be sensitive to what you're doing. You're talking to a lost soul about their eternal destiny. It's not time to talk about your pet theories or what interests you when somebody is drowning 
You don't talk about the lifeboat. How beautiful it is inside. How much the rations are and how well it's painted. You, th- you get them into the lifeboat by offering them the route to salvation, which is Jesus Christ. Remember, be, be sensitive to other souls. And if you've lost that, if you've become th- totally, you don't have a burden for souls anymore. You just talk to them and maybe look at them and judge them. Just get on your knees and say, God, forgive me. Give me a heart that loves people and cares for people and the sense to the fact that these people are lost unless they get in the lifeboat. Amen? No, I speak to myself. It's so easy to get familiar. And these people had got familiar. And God judged them. And of course we know in Deuteronomy what happened, that the snakes came amongst them as well. There was another time where Aaron was sent out with, with coals from off the altar to, to bring a salvation to the people and this time they had to look look and live look at the, the serpent which represented the sins which had a the serpent represented the sin itself and when they looked faith was in action and they were healed of this of the venom of the serpent so here we have the gospel and so we have this other story that these people are now ready they weren't allowed to go to the promised land It was only their descendants that were allowed. Even Moses was not allowed to cross the Jordan. And when we see the the journey to the promised land, we have two two separations. Number one, we read about them going through the Red Sea when they left Egypt. And that was a separation from the world. They were becoming out from the world and were becoming, if you like, the church. The church is the called out one. They were becoming a holy people who were separate to God. They were called out into the wilderness. Romans 6 verse 7 says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him, so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died had been set free from sin. That's why we practice baptism, dead to self, and we rise to Christ. Hallelujah! They were slaves to Egypt, we were slaves to sin. And when they passed through through the, the Red Sea, what happened? They were separated from the slavery. It was something of the past, and they wandered in the promised land. They were on the pilgrim journey, just like we are. They've not arrived. But you see, when it came to the point where they were going to inherit the promised land after going round the mountain, we read in Ephesians 2, verse 4, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and sealed us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So we're raised up into a new life. And we're actually, when these people, as Jord- as they're going to cross through Jordan now, they're going to inherit the land. And Joshua's going to lead them. And he's been told to be uh, courageous. Moses is dead. We're moving on. We're moving on. Don't dwell in the past. Moses is gone. Some of us would love to to dwell in the past. Moses is dead. We've got to inherit the land. And so what happens? The Jordan River typifies we're separated to something. You see? When they went through the Red Sea, they were separated from something. Cut away from something. Now we're separated into something into the promises of God. And we'll come out of the baptismal tank. If you've never been baptised, get baptised if you've trusted the Saviour. It's a public confession of an inward experience of salvation. Hallelujah. About time we had a baptismal service. Anybody will pray about that. Hallelujah. So God delivers them out of Egypt. And he brings them to the promised land. Canaan does not represent heaven. We still enter into our rest. Hallelujah. Ephesians 1 and 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. There's far more in store for us than simply being saved from the penalty of sin. A lot of people think being a Christian is you get saved, you're not going to hell anymore and then you live your life the way you live your life. No, there's a lot more to it. You're saved to something, not just saved from something. Hallelujah. And Jordan symbolizes death to self. Hallelujah. And alive to Christ. Hebrews 4, verse 
8 to 10 said, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest, so that no one will perish by following the examples of disobedience. And we've got lots of examples on what the children who were rescued from slavery did. We see a bad example. We have to follow the good example. Hallelujah. So let's move on in our study and look at Joshua himself. Joshua chapter 5. Now let me just uh, go back a wee bit here to verse 10. It's not on the screen, but I want to just make a point here. It's occurred to me. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal in the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. Hallelujah! Amen. They were remembering the blood. Glory to God. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day that they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites. But that year they ate the produce of Canaan. The divine provision and sustaining power which we have while we are on this walk with God was no longer required. Hallelujah! We are going to pass through into another dominion where we will be in the promised land. Thank God for every sustaining thing that God gives us in this life. But there'll come a time when it is no longer required. The man has stopped. Now, while Joshua's surveying the situation, something happened. Let's read what it says here. Uh, when Joshua was near Jericho, verse 13, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Let's quickly look at this. Hallelujah. This experience before they passed in to the promised land. Joshua probably thinking what he's been told. He's been given a task to do. He's to be courageous and all the rest of it. Moses is dead. He's now in charge. And, and that applies to every, one of our, every Christian. How do we go forward? And he's surveying the situation. And this man appears. What is his position? He's standing with a drawn sword. What does that suggest? He was either going to fight him. He was going to fight with him. Or he was going to fight for Israel. There are three options here. A man standing with a drawn sword. Ready for action. He's going to fight with him. He's going to fight against him. Or he's going to fight for them. And verse 14 tells us that this man came as captain of the host of the Lord, the commander of the Lord's army. This is what we call, I believe, a, a theophany. Or more, a theophany is a, an appearance of God. Uh, if you read John chapter 1, which talks about the Lord, beginning about Jesus, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. All things were made by him. More accurately, we could say it's what you call a Christophany, an appearance of Jesus Christ as captain of the Lord's house. Now, why do we say that? Why do uh, theologians say that this was a, a, an appearance of God or Christ? Well, there are reasons for that. Number one point is that an angel would not accept Joshua's worship. Joshua worshipped him. A man would not accept 
the worship of Joshua. Do you remember the story in Acts 14 when mighty things were happening with Paul and the apostles and they, 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 they wanted to make them into gods? And what did uh, Paul say to them? We are men like you. Get up. Don't bow down to us. Revelations 19 verse 10 says, Then the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, These are the true words of God. At this I fell down at his feet to worship him. This is John speaking. But he said to me, Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who holds the testament of Jesus. Worship God. For it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. So you see, this was an appearance of God. A theophany, a Christophany. Jesus Christ had come. Now what was the, the response to the man with the sword drawn? Joshua had concerns. He had courage, but he also had concerns. He was a stranger who suddenly appeared out in Obia. He's not one of ours. He wasn't recognised. Could he be the enemy? Or has somebody come to help us? And we face battles. But the answer is given. He said, No, rather I have indeed come as captain of the Lord's hosts. Now the, the answer comes in two parts. The first part of the answer is a flat no to Joshua's options. I'm not here to take sides, yours or that of anyone else. The second part of the answer gives the reason. I am here not to take sides, but to take over. Hallelujah! To take charge as the commander of the Lord's army. The Lord was there with the armies of heaven to secure Jericho. Hallelujah! And there are several principles here that we can maybe talk about next week because we've run out of time. But listen, as God sent to you, you know, sometimes we in the, in the Pentecostal church think we are the people. God's on our side. They used to sing a song, was it Bob Dylan or Donovan or somebody, if God's on our side, we'll win the next war. Listen, it's not a point that God is for us. As he is, comes to take over, not to take sides. We should be for him. Hallelujah. So we're going to talk about this and we'll maybe carry on with it next week. Because there's so much in it, there's a lot of principles in it. And uh, a lot of teaching in it about how to win battles for the Lord. And we've been hearing from Caleb this morning. By the way, Caleb was the guy that did get into the promised land. Well done, Caleb. As a namesake. He was able to go, although the people... But that was the overcoming strategy. Was that we allow the Lord... If you haven't learned anything this morning, because I'm out of time... We need to learn to let the Lord take over. Okay? Now Paul says your labour and the Lord is not in vain. But if we're going to see victory as we possess the land, we need to recognise that the Lord is the commander of the Lord's army. <laughs> Thank you.